Jabba the Hutt, a name everyone recognizes that immediately brings to mind a massive, disgusting, slug-like gangster that you just wish you could reach out and touch. I, I've always wanted to touch him. I, like, the texture of Yaba is something I, I need to discover. Is that universal or is that just Diego Luna? I think it's fairly common knowledge at this point that Jabba went through several design iterations before he finally appeared in Return of the Jedi, and today that's what we're going to talk about. Jabba the Hutt, from concept, to near appearance in the original Star Wars, to his completely different appearance in the comics, and finally, how he came to be in Episode 6. Jabba was a name that got thrown around in the first two drafts of Star Wars, but he really started to be developed in Draft 2. Luke needs to get to the planet Ogana Major, and Han agrees to fly him there in exchange for credits so he can pay off his debts to someone named Oxus. Although he doesn't have a ship of his own, he is part of a pirate crew. So he fakes a reactor overload on the pirate's ship, causing everyone to flee, allowing him to steal the ship. Jabba the Hutt is one of those crew members. So, we've got the name Jabba as a member of the criminal underworld, and we have the idea that Han Solo is steeped in debt to someone that, in the script, he describes as enormous. In the third draft, the story has changed so that Han does have his own ship, but it turns out Jabba the Hutt paid for it and has come to collect on the debt. Han, again, fakes a reactor problem, causing Jabba to flee. So now Oxus and Jabba have been combined into one character. As George Lucas began writing the fourth draft, he was still unsure of the Jabba character or how to use him. At one point, Han's troubles came from an imperial bureaucrat named Montross rather than a pirate or gangster, although Jabba was clearly still in contention for that role, as evidenced by some concept sketches of both characters on the same page. Of course, Jabba won out, and Lucas decided Han owed him money for dumping a shipment, which they discuss in a scene in Docking Bay 94, right next to the Millennium Falcon, the ship that Han now owns. And that's the scene we can now watch in the special edition of A New Hope. But many fans know that when it was originally shot in 1976, the hut was played by Irish actor Declan Mulholland. Lucas always intended for Jabba to be an alien, and he planned to cover Mulholland's performance with some sort of stop-motion creature. But post-production on Star Wars did not go smoothly with all the special effects shots, and George realized ILM wouldn't be able to finish Jabba in addition to all of the space battle sequences, so he decided to cut the scene. Harrison Ford and Marsha Lucas, editor on the film and George's wife at the time, both lobbied to keep the scene because there were important plot details included about Han's character. So all of those elements were moved over to the Greedo scene, which was initially in English. They gave Greedo subtitles and an alien language, reshot some of it, and included everything about Han's backstory there. That's why, when you watch the special edition now, a lot of the exact same lines and information are repeated. In the audio commentary for A New Hope, Lucas admits that Jabba himself isn't all that relevant to the first movie. It was more about setting up sequels that he didn't even know if he'd get to make, so he streamlined the story beats. All that to say, Jabba was taken out of Star Wars and his design was never finalized. But that didn't mean the character couldn't be included in the comic adaptation from Marvel, which came out shortly before the Marvel's release, and so Jabba the Hutt appeared for the very first time as a completely different looking character, although he does somewhat resemble the concept art I brought up earlier. This character is actually what inspired me to make this video, because I was rereading Kenobi by John Jackson Miller in preparation for the Obi-Wan Kenobi series, and in it, a character goes to meet with Jabba, but instead finds this being in his place. The Kenobi novel explains that this person, Moset Benid, was an accountant for Jabba the Hutt, and would occasionally conduct business under his boss's name. I completely missed that detail when I first read the book years ago, but this time it dawned on me that Mosep was indeed meant to be the comic version of Jabba the Hutt, which was confirmed by John Jackson Miller in Star Wars Insider issue 149. It's a bit of a sloppy retcon, and obviously doesn't work perfectly. Han would know the difference between Jabba and Mosep, but still, it's fun. The Nimbanel version of Jabba would appear in two more issues of the 1970s Marvel comics. Years later, when Jabba was finally going to be brought into Return of the Jedi, it was clear Lucas had no plans to follow what the comics had established, a tradition still going strong in Star Wars today. I'm just kidding. Kind of. George just said he wanted Jabba to be very large and very ugly. Phil Tippett, Ralph McQuarrie, and Joe Johnston submitted several pieces of concept art. One of them would go on to become as Morrigan, a character from Star Wars Rebels. Tippett described the process of making Jabba as a design free-for-all. They kept submitting ideas until George finally said, Yep, 
That's it. That's Jabba. Ultimately, Lucas wanted him to be like an extreme version of an evil sultan who was feared for his size, power, and status among commoners. He said there's always been rotund evil sultans who sit on their beds while others are tortured in front of them. Tippett created a model to present to George, which finally got his approval. And that's how Jabba the Hutt was born. First mentioned as a name in 1974, and then visually realized for the first time in 1981, before finally being shown to audiences on screen in 1983, and then added back into A New Hope in 1997. Like I said, this was inspired by Mosep Benid's appearance in the Kenobi novel, which came out in 2013. So, in a way, the evolution of Jabba the Hutt happened over the course of nearly 40 years. I just think it's interesting to look back at the development of some of these classic Star Wars elements that we take for granted nowadays, and remember that it's always been a collaborative effort to create every element we see on screen. But not only that, the universe has always been shifting and changing. Yeah, sometimes things get introduced in the comics and then changed on screen, and then another story will retcon the comic into something different, but that's been happening literally since Star Wars began. And I think we can all agree that the evolution of Jabba was worth it. Or at the very least, Diego Luna agrees. Jabba, come on, touching his, you know, like his belly, <laughs> like, ugh. But that's it for today. Let me know if there are any other evolution of Star Wars videos you'd like to see in the comments. If you haven't already, please like this video, subscribe to the channel, follow us on Twitter, TikTok, and Instagram, and consider checking out our Patreon page. As always, thanks for watching, and may the Force be with you.